Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church Heath. We're glad that you're here, and uh, we want to welcome all of you. And if you're a guest or a returning guest, we want to um, know that you're here as well. So I want to invite you all to take just a moment to register your attendance here. You can do that one of two ways. You can have um, open up your, your app that we have, and there's a register attendance that, that way, or you can um, fill out the blue and white card that's in your pew back. Either way, there's an opportunity there for you to fill out a prayer request, so share a joy or a concern with us. Let us know how we can be in prayer for you this week, for you or your family members. And then for those of you who are worshiping online at home, we do have Holy Communion in this service each and every week, and so I encourage you to take a moment to prepare your elements so that you can join all of us in... Um, the Sacrament of Holy Communion, and just a little bit later. All right, so we have today, we have our family field day. You know, this is not the weather I was <laughs> anticipating having, but we are still having our family field day. Kara has worked really hard on a lot of our activities, and so I invite you to continue to keep that on your calendar so our families will be gathering today to do that at 3 p.m. here. If it ends up raining, um, then we'll end up moving some of our games inside, but I think that once our kids get moving and going and our families do as well, then you'll see that it's a lot of fun, even if it's a little on the cooler side of things. Next um, Sunday, we're having our fifth Sunday potluck, and um, there'll be an opportunity for you to sign up later this week for um, what things you'll bring. I know that usually that's not the problem. It's always about, oh, we have too much food. It's so great. So I encourage you to come, and then that'll be immediately following the service. We have special guests next Sunday. So the residents of Genesis Women's Shelter will be coming here to join us for lunch. So I really do hope that you'll come. A couple of them are going to be bold and, and courageous and stand up in front of us and share their testimony with us, and we want to show our support of them. So it's really nice that we can open up our doors and make sure other people in our community are able to, to join us for that lunch. We are having our Servant Leadership Council meeting on May 2nd. We have hats coming up. Um, there's also an opportunity to uh, rejoin the Chancel Choir. They've had just a couple week break. But if you are wanting to sing, if you just, even if you're thinking, I don't read music, but I do like to sing, I know Kim will help you in that area. And it just seems like it's such a fun, wonderful group. So I encourage you to come and join us for choir practice. All right, with all of that, I encourage you to just take a moment to pause and breathe in the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place as we stand with one another for our call to worship. Open our eyes so we can examine the wonders of your instruction. Your laws are our joy. They are our most trusted advisors. Help us understand what your precepts are about so we can contemplate your wondrous works. Our spirit sags because of grief. Now raise us up according to your promise. Turn our hearts to your laws, not to greedy gain. Turn our eyes away from looking at worthless things. Make us live by your way. Amen.
All right, as our adults have a seat, I invite our kids to come forward for our time as we share the gospel with children. Which kids do we have? I'm trusting and hoping we have kids coming forward. (laughs) All right. I hear some movement, some rustling around. Do we have some kids coming forward? Okay. I have a blindfold on and I cannot see you. But what I'd love for you to do, do we have kids up front? Okay, fantastic. I did think I hear rustling. That's fantastic. Great. (laughs) Okay, so I cannot see. I promise you, I cannot see. And so um, I would like for you, our kids, to say something about your week, and don't tell me your name, and I'm going to see if I can guess who you are. Who wants to go first? Someone over here? Someone over here? Oh, this is an interesting game. Quiet. (laughs) You want to say something? I hear you over here. (laughs) <laughs> see, it's kind of fun when someone can't see. I'm trying to picture who that would be. All right, can someone say something? What? You went to a treehouse? Tree oh, goodness, whose voice is that? Tell me something else about the treehouse. Is that Jordan? Yes. yes! Okay. What are you saying? I went to Oklahoma. You went to Oklahoma. That's fun. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Is it Cohen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. I hear someone over here. We went to Urban Air. Urban Air? How fun. Did you jump a lot? Do you have fun green boots on? Is this Gemma? Oh, it is! Lucas is being really quiet. I didn't even hear you here. Okay, so I know that seems so silly. I had a blindfold on. It reminded me of our gospel story today. We have, um, there were some men who were walking together on a road, and some stranger was walking beside them, and they were talking about everything that was going on, and you know what? They were sad. They were sad. And this, because Jesus had died, exactly right. So, so you know this story? Yeah. Yeah, you do? Mm-hmm. And then, do you know who the stranger turned out to be? Jesus. Yes, but you know what? They didn't know that at first. They could not see that it was Jesus. And one of the first things he asked is, what are y'all talking about? And they said, are you, hello, do you not know what's been going on? And so they're talking to him, and only when he's invited into their house, and they, he breaks some bread in half that they suddenly see who it was, right? And sometimes we feel like we don't really know where Jesus is. Sometimes our eyes are closed, maybe almost like we had a blindfold on. But by hearing and knowing Jesus' voice and the things that Jesus would say, we figure out that it was Jesus. But it does sometimes take some time. But Jesus talks to them, and he lets them know, I walk with you on this journey. And so we pray, and we hope that we will be people who can open our eyes, open our heart, open our ears to what Jesus has to say, and that by doing so, we can be in this relationship with Jesus, and we could hear and recognize Jesus' voice. So that's what we're thinking about today, and I want you to listen to our, our sermon and our scripture that is read a little bit later today. So let's put our prayer hands together. I pray, God, for these kids that they are um, curious for the rest of their life, hoping that their eyes and their heart and their ears could all be open to receiving you, to notice you and how you walk alongside them. We give you thanks for doing that, for loving them and showing them who you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you all very much for participating in that little fun game. Would not have been as fun, though, if I was uh, down there by myself. <laughs> Go in. I got some good ones. Lucas, you're just so quiet. 
So we come to our time of pastoral prayer, and we want to certainly lift up those who need um, to be prayed for in our community and in um, our setting. I just realized I forgot my pen and paper that I usually have up here. So be thinking of those names and who it is we need to be in prayer for. Okay, so we want to pray for those who are battling cancer right now. And in our community, uh, our friends, in our congregation, we include Dorothy in our prayers, Buddy, Joe, Jerry, Sydney, and Brian. We lift up and we pray for those who've been grieving the loss of a loved one. Um, and, and in particular, we, we grieve for the Hyman and Cantrell family uh, for Alice's passing on the 14th. And her celebration of life is going to be on Saturday May 6th at 1 o'clock, and you're all invited to please come attend that. We want to always lift up and pray for the citizens of Ukraine and pray for peace in that region. What are some um, other areas where we need to be lifting people up in prayer? We pray for those who have upcoming surgeries, and then this week we definitely want to keep Pete in our prayer. Who else do we need to pray for? Dana, yes. Yes, thank you for saying that. The tornado victims, especially in Oklahoma, that time of year. Yes, James. Jenny Shaw's mother. Jenny Shaw's mother. I'll reach out to Jenny and get her name. Thank you, Jenny. Laura. Uh, Taylor Fisher Taylor for surgery on her wrist um, this week. Thank you. Who else do we need to be in prayer for this week? Bonnie? Yeah, it's a noticeable absence here without Bonnie by your side. So we'll continue to pray for Bonnie then. For her eyesight? For her health? Okay. Okay. Holding all of that in prayer, let us go to God now. Risen Christ, we come before you today from different paths that we're journeying on different roads. Some of us are certain of your joyful presence in our lives. Some of us not so certain of the hope of being touched by your joy and your presence. In this season, we often doubt and we question the authenticity of the resurrection. Sometimes we wonder, how is that even possible? Yet we are all here each and every Sunday, and we we reach out to you for understanding, for hope, for joy, for clarity, for all that is imperishable. So meet us here, Lord. Meet us here today in all of your power and consolation. We pray, God, that as you meet us here, that you hear and receive our prayer requests for our community. We pray for those who are hungry. We pray for those names that we've lifted up this morning and the names that are near and dear to us that rest on our heart quietly. We pray, for God, for those who've experienced loss of life and possessions and home with the destruction of tornadoes. Open our eyes, God, to see them, to be eager to serve all of the people who need to be served with a compassionate heart so that their eyes are open to your presence among them. Guide us to be faithful followers who share your story of resurrection to others, to be eager about sharing how you show us that that resurrection is truth, to boldly share our own story of resurrection through the ways that we encounter you on our road to Emmaus. Hear and receive all of our concerns and joys. Respond with your love. And may all of your creation experience resurrection now and in the future. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is alive. Alleluia. Amen. And I invite our ushers to come forward for our, our offering time. Those who are willing to um, help serve in this capacity. So we do a lot with Genesis Women's Shelter, and I, I hope that you will come next um, Sunday because this is an organization who is experiencing the love 
of God through so much that you do um, and our presence there and the ways that we, we engage and that we're active. Um, our mission committee and team will be joining together again for a meeting in the first part of May. If you have any interest in being involved in missions and being able to um, put forth ideas of ways that we can be beyond our doors, that's what we're all about to be, the hands and the feet of Christ beyond these doors, then definitely just send me an email or let me know and we'd be happy to invite you into that group. Let us pray now. God, receive these tithes and these offerings. Magnify them, multiply them, help us be your hands and feet on the community. God, we can be so insular, so inwardly focused at times that we forget that we are to share the good news of your Easter story of the resurrection out into the world. So through these offerings, through our tithes, May people be able to see you in their, in their life. May we help them see the love of, of God that you have available for all of them. May they see this church as a loving and generous church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> If you're able, please stand while the scripture is read. Uh, this morning's scripture is from Luke 24, 13 through 23 and 28 through 32. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus 
himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if, as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Resurrection appearance stories, I find them fascinating because each gospel writer writes it from their perspective with a unique audience and their unique encounters that people have with Jesus following his death and resurrection. About two weeks have passed since Easter for all of us, um, but even though that's happened and we start to move on with our lives, there is a meeting on a road that happens the exact same day as Easter, that Easter morning, but it happens later in the afternoon. So just imagine that it is the afternoon of that Sunday morning. It is the afternoon of Easter. And that shock of Jesus' crucifixion is still really raw for most everyone. At this point in time, only the women know that something miraculous has happened. They have gone to the tomb. They found that stone moved away. They saw that he's no longer in the tomb, but his clothes remain neatly fo folded um, on the, the bench, on the, on the slab. And so the grapevine gossip is alive. After hearing from the women about the stone barricade being removed from the tomb, there's been a disruption of things. Jesus' missing body, Peter runs to the tomb to verify their story. And upon seeing the linens, he is amazed and returns home. That's what's happened right up until the story that we get to for this afternoon. So a short while later... Two other disciples, they are deciding, well, it's Sunday evening, Passover is now done, it's time to move on. So they check out of their motel in Jerusalem because it's time to make that road trip home. The Passover festival is done. Their teacher and leader, Jesus, has been killed. Rome won again. And so they find no reason to remain in a city that offers no hope. In fact, this holiness of Passover feels a little tainted now. It's changed the feeling of Jerusalem in the city. And so they head to Emmaus, a village that we're told is about seven miles away that they're walking to. There's no rush, really, to get back to their old lives. Their feet shuffling along slowly on the road as they rehash the previous three days, the horrors of the last three days, and they're just rehashing it over and over. And we know this because we read in the scripture passage that they were sad, that they had hoped, past tense. That phrase, had hoped, Jesus was the one who would redeem Israel. It just captures the heartbreak, just the downtroddenness of this walk home of their experience. 
Cleopas and his companion have lost hope in the face of his political death of Jesus, and everyone is getting blamed. They're talking about Judas's betrayal. They're talking about the different versions of, of things that they had heard, of the events that have gone on. You, you've got one saying to the other, and did you hear that Peter actually denied Jesus and knowing Jesus? And they spend the next mile playing that torturous game, what if? What if we had some, did something different? What if Peter had said something different? What would it have looked like um, if, if we had stepped up, if we had all rallied as disciples, unable to rewrite what they could have prevented about the previous three days, they figure that they've learned a lesson about excessive expectations. Perhaps they went into a city with too much hope in Jesus as the Messiah. And then a couple miles in, you've got them talking, well, wait a second, there was that that thing, what was, the, what was it the women were saying this morning, that tomb, the tomb was empty? I mean, do you really believe them that there were these angels talking to them about where Jesus is? Is Jesus really alive? And they're just having this mixture of emotion, this turmoil. So on this road of broken dreams, a stranger suddenly joins them. He's eavesdropping, and then he asks them what they've been talking about. And we know it's Jesus. They do not. And I find it funny that Jesus' very first words in the Gospel of Luke, the very first words in his resurrected state are, what are you two talking about? Not like, hello, <laughs> it's me. I told you that this is going to be happening, and I'm here in front of you. But, but what are you two talking about? To which the men just stop. It says that they stood still. They just stop in their tracks. And they basically reply, are you clueless? How do you not know what's going on? How do you not know what it is that we're talking about? When you think about it, it's a little absurd and laughable that Cleopas and the, his friend cannot recognize immediately the man that they thought they, that was the Messiah just three days before. The text actually says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Some commentators will, and scholars will say that it's something that God did. Others will speculate maybe it was something else. What was it that prevented them from seeing Jesus? Was it their own grief just caught up in all of that emotion and the heaviness of the last three days? Or was it the lack of understanding what Jesus was talking about that restricted their ability to see who it was that was standing in front of them? A few days ago, I had a lot on my mind as I was getting into my car to drive home after a full day at the church. And I thought about my unfinished to-do list from the week, the different follow-ups that I hadn't done and finished. I ran through my schedule for this coming week, and of course, then naturally names and faces come to my mind, people that I haven't seen since Easter Sunday, wondering where they are, how they're doing, maybe I need to follow up with them, people who I've been talking to but I haven't talked to in a little while to see how things are going in their life. I thought of the, the people that I need to um, check on because they're dealing with a lot of grief and stress in this season of their life. And my empathetic heart was, was dealing with a lot of those kind of feelings from all of those kind of things. And then my thoughts morphed into what's next? What's next for this family or that family? What could possibly be next as they meet with doctors? And then I started thinking about our whole church. What's next for our church? What's, what's next? So the next thing that we do in, with the city of Heath to let people know that we're here for them, that we want them to feel connected with the faith family. And then I started to feel excitement and curiosity. So that's a lot of that inner monologue that was going on. And before I knew it, I pulled into my driveway, I turned off the car, and I said, how did I get here? And I don't mean that metaphorically speaking. I mean, I sat there and thought, oh my goodness, I am home. How did I get here? Because I know that somehow I, I drove there and putting that car in park, I know, that I, I know that I probably went through a few different lights. I can't tell you right now if they were red or green. I hope I obeyed the red ones. But my mind was so distracted and I'm certain there were other cars, but I was in this autopilot zone of things. I was completely distracted by my swarming thoughts. So on my drive home, did my thoughts, my preoccupation with the past few weeks, my fear and excitement and anxiety of the future, did that all distract me from seeing Jesus in that moment? When I allow my mind to run wild, more often than not, I notice that that's where it goes. It is either going to dwell on the past or be consumed with the future. 
when I'm always focused on what didn't get done or what needs to get done, all of that stuff, does it allow any room for an encounter with Jesus Christ in the present, in the actual present moment, the right now? Like these two disciples, we can often find ourselves on our own road to Emmaus. Two weeks out from Easter, wondering about the meaning of the Easter experience, wondering, okay, what now? What changes for us as Christians, as Easter people? Well, some of us are embracing the Easter season, trying to discern the meaning of what has happened in the gospel story. What, what is that meaning, that really rich meaning of the resurrection and my own experience? Is there any persuasive reason to believe that Jesus really was resurrected and raised from the dead? If I embrace that truth, what does that mean in my life in 2023? If I believe into the people who saw the empty tomb, if I believe like those who encountered Jesus' presence in that upper room and got to see his wounded, resurrected state, or, or if I believe like those countless saints who have gone before me, who believed but did not even see or touch and feel, what does that truth of Jesus' resurrection mean for how I live and what I do in my life? Some of us find ourselves walking on a different Emmaus road during times when we wonder if, if God is really present in the turbulence and the chaos of our lives, especially when we don't feel very in control of our situation, when we're too distracted by overwhelming emotions to see the divine presence of the resurrected Christ. Sometimes we're in a state of confusion or grief or hopelessness like those men when they said, we had hoped he was the one. And then there are some of us who walk the road just expecting to get to our normal lives. That was a resurrection that happened a long time ago. We can talk along the way that all of these things have happened as though nothing more than death had happened. And so in some kind of twisted way, kind of staying in that Good Friday moment. The Easter happened a long time ago. It doesn't happen again now. Beloved pastor and author Frederick Beekner interprets Emmaus as this. It is the place that we go in order to escape. It could be a bar. It could be a movie. It could be whatever that we need to go to throw up our hands and say it makes no difference. Emmaus, he said, may be buying a new gadget, buying a new car, drinking way more than you really want or really need, reading a second-rate novel or going to church on Sunday and just being part of the rinse, lather, repeat kind of mundane. He says that Emmaus is whatever we do whenever we go to make ourselves forget that the world holds nothing sacred, that even the wisest and the bravest and the loveliest decay and die, that even the noblest ideas that men have had, the ideas of love and freedom and justice, have always in time been twisted out of shape by selfish means for selfish ends. That's how he describes that road to Emmaus. But here when Jesus chooses to take that moment to meet those two men, they stand still. And he meets them there at a crossroad where the risen Christ asks to reflect on the meaning of the things that have taken place, effectively calling us to just halt for a moment, halt our frantic forward momentum and listen to the question of a stranger who is prompting us to admit we have kind of lost our way. We don't know where to go now. You see, the risen Lord meets us on our road to Emmaus's in the ordinary places, in the ordinary experiences of our lives, and in the places with which we retreat when life is too much for us. The risen Christ meets us. And the beauty of this resurrected encounter is God's divine promises in the everyday and familiar journeys of life. He lets those men go for a little while, tormented and struggling with one another and meeting and talking and kind of mulling over what has happened. And then he finds this particular moment in this particular place on this road to encounter them when they were ready. Okay, yes, the two disciples did not see on that road that they were walking alongside their Messiah. They overlooked the Messiah who was walking alongside them. But Jesus Christ doesn't give up. 
He doesn't let that distraction prevent them from experiencing the truth of his resurrected state. And in the lack of recognition of who Jesus is, Jesus sees the necessity of intervention. Jesus loves to intervene in our lives just immediately when, we, when, when he knows that we need it the most. And he tells them a story. And he shares with them scripture. He talks about Moses and the prophets. And he's giving the whole backstory about who Jesus is. And when Jesus does the most Jesus thing of all, everything changes. All of this conversation, it, it calms their anxiety. It's stirring something in their hearts. It's preparing their hearts to hope again. They can't quite articulate what it is, but there's something that's going on. And as they get closer to their home, the disciples feel moved to invite the stranger into their home to rest and have a meal. And that's when the big reveal happens, when we make room for Jesus Christ, when we're in that moment, when we make room for hospitality, they encounter the fullness of his identity. And it's when they share a meal that they begin to realize they have been walking and talking with Jesus Christ all along. This wonderful and rich story has layers of meaning which we can peel back for our contemplation. We could talk about this for weeks. We really could. There's so many amazing parts of this Emmaus story. But the significance of Jesus walking alongside two disciples, two disciples who are talking about the events that transpired over the weekend. I cannot overlook that. There's got to be something that we question there. Why two? Human beings feel and find God as presence, primarily in relationships. It happens time and time again, especially in friendships in which love of God is at the core of their friendship. Many pastors and, and theologians and scholars have celebrated that friendships based on shared religious vision, that's the stuff, that's the very stuff of the Easter church. Not only are we called to serve others, but we're invited um, to be sustained, to be challenged, to be loved into the image and likeness of God by one another. Now, I recently read a poll of Christians who are actively engaged in um, a variety of church ministries. So these are already Christians who are engaged in ministry, already engaged in their church. And they were asked about their spirituality. What are the type of resources you turn to? Um, what enriches your faith and your faith lives? What are the spiritual disciplines that you practice? And they were also asked to recount the most powerful experience of God they had. And what struck me the most was that their most noticeable experience of God had occurred in the context of relationships. 90% of those respondents spoke about that, that it happened with somebody else, either in a friendship or with a spouse or with a parent or with children, or it could be that it was a, it was a faith encounter, sharing group, an accountability group, a Sunday school class, or a worshiping community. They even cited experiences with a coworker in a very secular kind of atmosphere and setting. I sometimes think that with COVID and with society's increasing preference for um, individualistic growth, I kind of expected more one-on-one -on -one with God kind of answers in this day and age. People reading scripture alone or walking in the woods alone or, or going to some kind of quiet retreat alone, or, or being deep in prayer. Instead, the overwhelming majority of people had found God most clearly in and through other people. It was actually another person, it was a stranger, really, who pointed out God's call on my life to be a minister. After hearing her words, that just said, there's no way, I suddenly could hear and see God more clearly than I had just 10 minutes beforehand in that moment. And I felt some kind of stirring in my heart, but it took someone else to point it out to me. That's what this is. That's what the stirring is. So it should not surprise us that this story of Emmaus moves from isolation to community. It is in community that God does amazing work through people. Christ joins himself to those who are on the way, who then make space for him in the village. God always allows and always creates space 
for the other in order that true community might actually be formed. After Jesus revealed himself, and then he, he, look, the second that they know it's Jesus, he is gone in an instant. That's all that, that he needed to do in that moment. And he's no longer in view. Those disciples, they begin to talk with each other transparently about the self-revelation. One says, were not our hearts stirring when he was opening the scriptures to us? Did you feel that too? It's so amazing when you're sitting with somebody else, you're like, did, did I just see that or did you see that too? It is such a wonderful thing. And then it builds on one another. Scripture is best understood in community because we need others. We need others to interpret Scripture for us. We need others to challenge our, our insular readings. Indeed, we need others' interpretations to challenge our narrow hearts. We need others to open up Scripture so we see it anew for the first time. Luke's narrative it takes us on the road frequently. There is a journey that brings Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. There is the road that is the setting for the parable of the Good Samaritan. There is a road that leads the prodigal son home back to his family and his father. Jesus, at the very beginning, sets his eyes on Jerusalem, and he pretty much takes the entire gospel to get there. He is traveling that entire time. That road brings him together. It brings all of us together. A road carries us to a new job or to a new city, and the road becomes a symbol of our growing faith. But we don't travel that one alone. The Emmaus story is sometimes called the journey of every Christian. It has all of the elements of life, if you think about it. It has discouragement in it, it has disappointment, it has doubt, it has risk, it has all of the wonder, but the critical nature of companionship is there. It has deep, deep faith. It has joy. It has hope resurrected. It has all of those kind of things. It has the recognition of Jesus Christ in our midst. What are those spiritual conversations that we're having on the way to our next destination or even to our destination of nowhere, where, nowhere in particular? What are those conversations we're having with one another? And just know, with all of the assurances of a God who loves you, that Jesus Christ finds and will continue to find ways to intervene just when you need him at that perfect crossroad, that perfect moment, in exactly the way that you need him to reveal himself, where you need him for as long as you need him. And we give God thanks for that in our resurrection stories. Let us pray. Mysterious and divine presence, too often our hearts burn within us because our bodies know, we just know something is going on, but our minds, our minds can get distracted. It can be so focused on the past, it can be so focused on the future that we miss the present and the presence of you working in us and through us in this world. So open our eyes when we feel discouraged and distracted Help us to recognize you in all the places and the people and the journeys that we take. We give you thanks, God, for the resurrection and these encounters that we have with you. Help us to believe in the truth of the resurrection, to hold on to it and recognize that that is a promise for all of us as well. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Broken bread nurses our broken faith each and every time. Uh, this, is, this story is just like a perfect communion story. Shared bread reminds us that Christ joins himself to those who are on the way, that God is revealed through um, the space for making room for others, that God is revealed through hospitality and a shared meal. So we pray that God will open our eyes as we feast this morning with one another. And we pray that we will feel awake and alive as our hearts stir and that we're renewed with hope each and every day, each and every Sunday that carries us then through that week, carries us on that journey on the way. So let us make our confession and begin our great thanksgiving, confessing to one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. 
We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for every single one of you. Before, before you were even born, Christ died for you, and that proves God's love for us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join with them in their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism and suffering and death of his resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he gathered with all of his friends, every single one of them, even those who would betray him. And he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given to you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, again he gave God thanks, and he gave it to all of his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your, your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of children of God, all of his disciples were taught how to pray, and we will lift up our voices united together as one voice saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, our communion helpers, please come forward. Each and every week, I remind you that this is Christ's holy table. This is where we expect as Christians to encounter Jesus Christ. It was in the breaking of the bread that those disciples' eyes were opened. And so each and every week, we remember how important it is to share a meal with one another. So when you come forward, we take our communion with a piece of the bread and dip it into the juice to receive both elements at once. But if you'd like, we have individual servings and gluten-free, and that is so that we can further expand that table to include everyone, to make that meal possible for everyone.
there are several more resurrection stories to come. We sit in this Easter season, and thanks be to God, there are always resurrection stories to come. That's what's so wonderful and promised to us with Jesus Christ resurrected. We are all redeemed and resurrected as well. So receive this benediction. Friends, it's time to go. So set your feet on that path. Continue on that path of hope, even if initially it doesn't look like hope. Because our living God walks alongside us to celebrate in that resurrection so that we can share that good news with others who need to hear it. Amen. Amen. Thank you.